Hello, I'm delighted to be here today at the STS meeting in San Diego. I'm here interviewing Dr. Gerdish for our CTS Net video regarding his presentation yesterday, Astronomy Without Mobility Restrictions. Dr. Gerdish, thank you so much for being with us today. Could you please Thanks. introduce yourself for the audience? Of course. I'm Mark Gerdish. I'm Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis. Wonderful. So. Your topic is very stimulating. Tell me how you do sternotomies and then post no mobility restrictions whatsoever on your patients. Very intriguing. Yeah, so it's really uh, part of what we kind of consider ERAS 2.0. Uh, it's a seven-year project that we've been that we've undertaken. Uh, it was an outgrowth, really, of we have a, a robust minimally invasive program, and we were able to essentially eliminate the use of opioids and give people full activity very quickly uh, using certain nerve block techniques. And we wanted to be able to achieve the same thing for the sternotomy patients. So we had a 97% reduction in the use of opioids and nobody getting discharged, zero patients getting discharged with opioids. And that was really an outgrowth of the fact that they were comfortable, they were mobile, and they were leaving the hospital well. So we wanted to try and accomplish the same thing in the sternotomy patients. And the first you know, foundational element to that was rigid sternal fixation. In other words, every single patient having a complete orthopedic repair of the bone. Uh, not a partial stabilization, but a complete orthopedic repair of the bone. And what we found with that was with the lack of micro movement, patients were much more comfortable. And then over the ensuing few years, we found that we could, again, eliminate opioids, 93% reduction in the use of opioids uh, at, during the entire hospitalization. 50% uh, of patients getting zero opioids the whole time they're there, there and go. only 6% of the patients going home with new opioid prescriptions. Now, I'm, I'm talking about the opioids because that is an outgrowth that is an outgrowth of the fact that these people are comfortable, they're up, they're moving. And so consequent to all of that was a steady increase in patients getting extubated in the operating room. Uh, essentially, everyone getting out of bed within the first four hours after getting to the unit and getting extubated. Um, the next day, everybody's staying out of bed, and we saw a decrease in the incidence of delirium, an increase in uh, GI function, and then people feeling well, and again, getting out of the hospital quicker. So some people like to look at, for example, length of stay. So yeah, we see this steady decline in length of stay, but I think more importantly, we saw a reduction from seven years ago, 30% of patients going to extended care facilities of some type, some type of rehab down to 9%, even 8% of patients going to some type of extended care facility. So this is in a program with high acuity, a lot of multivalves, a lot of redo operations, a lot of elderly people who walk with walkers. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's uh, great. And we just let them get up and walk with their walker and use their arms. Mm -hmm. And progressively, we got to the point now where we let people, some people drive immediately when they leave the hospital. Other mm -hmm. folks will tell them to wait five days after they leave the hospital. Uh, so giving people their full mobility when they leave. Um, the way we really kind of grade ourselves is how many days are we giving people at home, in their community, back to their normal lives? And uh, we feel like we've really achieved that. So one of the ways, the best barometer, I think, for doing that is to extend the window when you look at the outcome. So. And we watched our uh, readmission rate steadily decline. So 30-day readmission rate crept all the way down to 6.5%, kind of held there at the 6 to 7% range, which is a good number. Very low. More importantly, though, 90 days, only a 2% bump. So 9% readmission at 90 days for the entire population of our, our, our entire po patient population. Um, so we feel like that gives us a better indication globally how the patient's doing re-engaged in their life, back doing their normal things, and not coming back to the hospital for any reason. And as you mentioned previously in one of your papers, uh, sternal readmissions typically don't happen during the first 30 days. So if that's all that you're looking at, you're missing a lot of the data capture and some of those complications that may be dealt with in the physician's office other than the surgeon's office. So I think extending your capture to that is, is absolutely critical to really establishing the benefit of this. I think um, it's also, not to interrupt, I think it's important to recognize that it's not just sternal complications. It's yes. global complications, yes. which means in that package of restoring people to full mobility and avoiding some of these medications and keeping them back at their normal level of performance, that we 
uh, we avoid heart failure, we uh, decrease the incidence of people coming back for other complications, things mm -hmm. outside of the sternum. Sure. No, that makes perfect sense. If patients are moving and breathing, they're going to have less pneumonia, right. they're going to have other, right. other complications. I, I think it sounds like a fabulous idea. Um, one question that I have is, do you believe that some of these uh, mobility activities and, and extending that uh, could happen without the sternal fixation, or do you feel like that's really a critical element of those um, mobility, making patients more mobile? Right. So it does, there are multiple components to it, and that includes every patient that comes to the operating room gets uh, an erector spinae block as soon as they come in the operating room. Well, minis get it on one side, sternotomies get it on both sides. That kind of enhances the the, or reduces the discomfort in the entire chest early after surgery. So that helps. But the thing is, when you want to get somebody up out of bed and they have to hug a pillow or they can't use their arms to push out of bed, so the reason that we don't have to send people to extended care facilities is because uh, elderly people can use their arms to get up out of a chair, arms to get up off the toilet, arms to do their normal activities. Mm -hmm. So the day after surgery, we let people lift, lift 10 to 15 pounds in each arm. So a 30 pound lift the day after surgery and that you can't really do, right? you know, and so we do ask them to use both hands as much as possible, mm -hmm. but they don't always. Got it. Uh, so I don't, I think that, you know, I think that that's a foundational element to this. If mm -hmm. we're going to, if we're going to accelerate the recovery, if we're going to put people back in full activity, you really have to take the motion out of the bone. The sternum has to be rigidly fixed. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it is all the other things that we do to minimize discomfort, to enhance mobility. And as those medications come down, their alertness goes up and people feel better. And as a result of that, you know, we achieve what we've achieved. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is that sternal fixation is a critical part of this package, if you will. Um, and it seems to be a key component of what you're doing to get very good outcomes at 90 days, which is something that not all of us are looking at. I think we all need to. Um, one final question for you. I've done a lot of work in resuscitation, and so I'm quite curious. We, we do, you know, how do you manage sternal fixation in a patient who needs to have an urgent reoperation in the ICU? Such an important question. And um, so, of course, we have the uh, cutters that are required to divide the plates if we have to get back into the chest in the intensive care unit. Um, and I always tell people to remember to divide the plates first and then take the wires out because we do use wires for circlage to bring the bone together and then right. plate. Um, but uh, the fact is, uh, I've had two patients over the last several years, both of whom survived quite well, uh, that we had to do that for. The other thing I would point out that I think is actually pretty important is if someone has rigid fixation and they do require an episode of chest compressions, mm -hmm. the chest compressions are much better with rigid fixation. Mm -hmm. Plus, the likelihood of you had, well, we've never had anybody that had to go back to be restabilized. Okay. So uh, they hold up very well. You get good chest compressions if you have to do it, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, and then just being aware and ready, uh, it only adds seconds to the, to the re-entry. Uh, that sounds like a, uh, you've thought it through very well. Your staff is prepared for it. And uh, in the STS guidelines, that was really our, our request, is that if you're using some sort of alternative closure techniques, right. that the ICU is aware and the ICU knows how to manage those once the patient arrives there. Um, very interesting paper. Thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to hearing more about your, uh, your whole program of ERAS 2.0. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.